Thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to present some joint work with collaborators from uh, various places uh, um, about continuum percolation. I'm not sure if, I know that some of you are real experts in this field, but maybe not all of you. So uh, let me just briefly give you the, uh, the classical model. So we consider uh, a random cloud of points in space without accumulation points. And these points um, are, uh, come with some interaction radius. In the easiest case, it's just a fixed ball with some fixed radius. And um, we are interested in the clustering properties of the joint sets. And this classical model goes back to Gilbert in 61, called, uh, sometime, sometimes it's called the Gilbert graph. And it's already in his paper and also in my talk, um, there will constantly be the reference to what's an application area of communication systems. So you imagine, these networks component, network components, they can send messages whenever their interaction radius overlap. And by this, there is a, a random graph in space. And our, the most, uh, in, or, or the, the first question that, that uh, people typically address is the existence of an infinite component. And that would somehow give us uh, a rough idea of how well such a peer-to-peer -peer network works. Is it possible with a positive probability to send a message uh, over long distances? So this is the Gilbert graph or sometimes uh, called the Boolean model. Uh, by the way, in the, in the classical model, this point process is a Poisson point process, which refers to a situation where you have essentially no statistical knowledge about the, the distribution of the points in space. The key characteristics are that the distribution of the Poisson point process is independent over uh, distinct parts of the space. And we will mainly uh, actually only speak about translation invariant settings. Then the Poisson point process is a one parameter family of distributions of uh, point clouds in space. The parameter is, uh, is the expected number of points in a unit volume. So this model has been extended in a large variety of ways in the last 60 years. And I will be focusing on one extension of this model towards random environments. So, I will think of, so the, the point cloud is now not anymore a Poisson point process, but it is a so-called Cox point process, which is a Poisson point process where the intensity measure is now also random. This intensity measure, I will call it capital lambda, is, uh, is independently distributed. And I will uh, always assume that the unit volume gets a finite mass and it's also stationary. So the whole system is again stationary. And a slight extension from this classical model is also that the, I will always assume that these are not always, but for the most part, assume that these interaction balls here are, are IID random. So this radius, the, every network component has its own individual interaction range and to make this non-trivial, oops, sorry, the, there will be some positive mass on positive radius. So the Cox Boolean model is then the union of these balls. And here is one picture that you could keep in mind that combines two parts of stochastic geometry so the environment here is given by a Poisson-Voronoi tessellation. 
And the idea for such a picture actually comes from talking to people from industry. You could imagine maybe these line segments constitute some city topology, and then the network components, the particles, they only sit on the edges of the Boston Voronoi tessellation and thereby create this, this um, Cox Boolean model, which has now three layers of independent randomness. There is an environment layer, there is the Poisson point process layer, and then there is the layer of the random balls. To give you some examples for the environment, you can consider, for instance, singular random environments, as in this picture, where um, the environment is of lower dimension. So the, the whole point process is in R2 in this picture, but nevertheless, the Poisson point process is in a lower dimensional space. So you can think of some segment process, random segment process, and then just um, this um, environment measure is the one dimensional house. Level. So as I said before, examples that you could keep in mind are Poisson Voronoi tessellations or Poisson Delaunay tessellations, Poisson line tessellations that could, um, or Manhattan grids that could somehow serve as models for rectangular city topology. By the way, you can interrupt me at any time. A second class of environment measures can be um, constructed by using some random, um, some, some, some absolute continuous change uh, against the, uh, the back measure. Um, for instance, I could imagine some stationary random closed set, and I have a certain intensity whenever I'm inside the set, I have a certain other intensity whenever I'm outside the set. For instance, in this picture, my environment is another Poisson Boolean model, and I have some intensity on top of the green area, and away from the green area, I have intensity zero. Uh, in, in applications, uh, this shot noise field is also an important environment. This somehow you accumulate the influence of an independent Poisson point process. Uh, towards a, a position x. So you somehow you have this function k and you, uh, this kernel function, and then you somehow sum up all the influences of this independent Poisson point process, uh, its influence towards the position x. Another example that, that will become useful by creating, um, I mean, distinguishing things is, is this version of the short noise field you still um, you somehow accumulate the influence of uh, an independent Poisson point process, which carries its own marks. Is this clear? So first, let, let's get out of the way some um, basic properties that you also find in the classical uh, Poisson Boolean model, the Gilbert graph. And that is concerned with one dimension and um, the existence of certain moments of the uh, random radii. So here's the first statement. Um, if the d moment of these radii exists, then you don't see full coverage with probability. You, um, there is positive mass that you don't see full coverage. If you have additional ergodicity, since this is a translation variant event, in fact, full coverage ha happens with probability. Uh, just to complement this, it's already in the standard textbook on the field. If this D moment is absent, then you have full coverage with probability one. These balls are simply too big. They have too heavy tails and you just cover the whole space and uh, the model is, uh, is trivial. One dimension is also special when it comes to uh, the existence of unbounded components. Um, in one dimension, under ergodicity of the, of the environment, um, in, in a setting where you don't have full coverage, 
then uh, uh, the Cox Boolean model cannot contain an unbounded connected component. This is, um, is just recovering uh, um, what is already known for, uh, for the standard, for the classical model, um, um, for the Poisson point process instead of the Cox point process already in these connections. Just to highlight a few more um, results in that direction by some of my co authors. So the fact that you have uh, no infinite connected components in one dimension, you can also see in a variety of other models uh, like the Lily Pond model or, um, or even in, in some nearest neighbor model where, where you, you fix the degree and you know already that all your connected components must be passes through, through, um, through the space that they must be one dimensional. And then you can also under rather general conditions and also far beyond the Poisson case um, um, prove that, that uh, there cannot be infinite connected components. I want to speak about the uniqueness question. And this already, I, I need to, to introduce some, some technical things, but it's maybe not as hard as it, as it looks looks to you at first glance. So you can imagine that if you have a random environment, you can, you can force the system to do many different things. You can just create an environment where you, you force the system to have distinct infinite components. So you have to introduce some conditions on the environment in order to ensure that there is a unique infinite component. And this is one condition that is also closely related to the other conditions that I will present in a minute. So this condition um, somehow ensures that with high, so just, just roughly speaking, ensures that with high probability in large volumes, you can connect, uh, you have support from the environment um, that, that allows you to connect points. So there is, a, um, so this is the notion of essentially our connectedness. So you have connectivity radii that are on the same probability space and jointly stationary. So these are some um, random variables, like um, what is the closest point, uh, some, some, um, uh, some, some field or some information here. And the statement is, is the following, or the, the condition, the definition is the following. So you want these uh, um, connectivity radii so, the, so the, the event that they are large in a, in a large box should uh, go to zero, so the probability of this event. And then the main statement is under this event, so don't worry about this one half and this two here, it doesn't matter. Um, so under this event, which has a high probability for large alpha, you should be able to find, to connect any two points in the support of this smaller box here, by a sequence, a finite sequence, oops. This, this uh, essential R connectedness will allow us to prove uniqueness. So just to, 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 to highlight, uh, so, uh, to go back to our examples, um, for, for instance, this uh, sta the stationary sec uh, um, um, closed set here, uh, if, if you have positive mass, positive intensity everywhere, then uh, this condition is satisfied. It's also satisfied for uh, our example of uh, poisson voronoi poisson delon tessellations. They are all essentially are connected for all R. However, the shot noise field or this uh, version of the shot noise field, they're in general not R. Essentially R. Okay, then under this condition, as I promised you, and ergodicity. Um, Indeed, uh, there can only be one, at most one, uh, infinite connected component. Why do I impose this condition? Well, if I remove it, and I, I, I assume this, then I can check the textbook and I already know that for all stationary point processes, um, or in this, in this case, for the Poisson point process, I have uniqueness. So in, what is this, this is saying is that if I can have balls with positive probability of arbitrary uh, size, then I can 
with positive probability connect all components in some final volume. And then by, by ergodicity, if this has positive probability, it must be, uh, have probability one. So this is why I'm imposing this. So the, the proof uses uh, a classical approach of Burton Keen um, plus some FKG arguments using the fact that conditioned on the environment, you have the FKG inequality uh, because you're working with the Poisson point process. Uniqueness is also a big field. This is one of the classical questions in continuum percolation. So I, I've also um, written down some references here for uniqueness. Uh, for instance, for nearest neighbor graphs, you have a uniqueness condition. This is also a very nice condition, insertion tolerance. So there is some overlap with our condition, but it's not the same. So if you have uh, a positive density uh, of, the, uh, of the point process when you insert a point or finitely many points with respect to the original process, then this can also puts you in a situation where you have uniqueness of the infinite component. Level set percolation is also uh, an example, or you can also see this uh, mentioning ma mainly here also things going beyond the Poisson case. Um, Ginebra ensembles, Gaussian zero processes, also there you have the uniqueness uh, of the infinite component if it exists. So let's go to critical behavior as I, I mentioned in the, in the beginning, one is interested in the clustering behavior our network, if you want to think in, in that terms, um, has good connectivity properties if you have an infinite component. But what means infinite component? You can have a variety of notions for, um, for critical values. And here are some. So I want to now consider, um, in order to, to be able to tune the system, um, I want to fix the intensity measure to have uh, on average intensity one. And then I have an addi additional scalar um, parameter here, which now allows me to tune the intensity of the, the expected number of points in a unit volume. I speak about the um, connected component containing the origin. And then I have essentially three different notions of um, percolation. The first one is, what is the smallest intensity that you need in order that the origin is connected to infinity in terms of Lebesgue volume? So the Lebesgue volume of the Boolean model of the, uh, connected of the connected component of the origin is infinite. You can ask the same question for the diameter and also for the number of points, right? And I, our approach will allow us to, to, to derive even more detailed information. We get uh, the, the, the tail behavior the, um, of, of all these um, quantities. So I can also define, depending on the moment S, uh, a critical lambda that, that um, such that this moment does not exist anymore. So I have rather detailed information about the distribution of the uh, uh, Lebesgue volume, the diameter, and the number of points of the uh, connected component of the origin. So in order to convince you that, that there's something interesting to be explored here, um, using random environments, it is um, quite easy to derive pathological behavior in terms of percolation. For instance, if your environment is just insufficiently connected so that you, you're not able to create infinite components, then of course, all these critical values are zero. Or oh, sorry, infinity. So you you only have a subcritical case. On the other hand, which is maybe slightly more surprising, but not anymore if you think of it, you can also create environments where you only see a positive probability for infinite comp components. The easiest example is maybe this. Some some people call it the mixed Poisson. So you just look at the environment which is given by a single random variable, which is unbounded. So then somehow it is of course not ergodic, well, it's governed by a single random variable. Um, but as you can easily see, well, you, you, for, for a realization of Z, you, you look at a certain, so Z is always then multiplied by lambda. So if you give me a lambda, I multiply it by a maybe very small lambda, I multiply it by a very large Z, then I, I'm in the supercritical regime for percolation of the Poisson point process. And, um, 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 
this, this, this leads to, to a situation where I always see a supercritical um, component. So all these critical values are zero. So there's something to be done here. To, to, you have to some, uh, impose some, some conditions on the environment in order to see non-trivial behavior. Also here, let me, let me mention some, um, some other works in that direction. For instance, um, here a work by, by Yogesh, and, um, where they want to move beyond the Poisson case, uh, considering attractive point processes. And um, they also feature an example of a Cox point process that only has a supercritical point. This, this uh, is, um, these SINR models are interesting also in telecommunications. These are slightly different models um, where the clustering behavior uh, depends in a non-local way on the environment. I just mentioned this because one sees in these models um, sometimes an in and out of percolation. So, so if, your, if your intensity is very low, you see absence of percolation, then you enter an intermediate regime where you see percolation. And then if the intensity is too large, the particles around you create some interference and you're unable to communicate and you lose the percolation, you, you go out of the percolation regime. All right, so as I said, one has to um, impose some condition on the environment in order to see non-trivial behavior. And this is the condition of stabilization. This is somehow, somehow related to the essential connectivity that uh, essential uh, R connectedness that I showed you previously. Again, um, we consider stabilization radii attached to every point in space, jointly stationary on the same probability space. And with high prob with a uh, low probability, these um, stabilization radius are large in large boxes. Yeah. So this event comes with high probability. And if this event happens, and I consider um, my environment in a, in a box, Around this x, and these boxes are, uh, are the, and these boxes are far away from each other. Then, this family is independent. So this is, uh, this is a, a bit bit heavy to to understand, uh, but but maybe if I make an example, then then it becomes more clear what happens here. Before I make an example, strong forms of stabilizations are B dependence, where this has probability zero already for, for alpha larger than B, or exponent, exponential stabilization, where this probability goes to zero exponentially fast. So here are some examples. Short noise fields are not uh, stabiliz uh, stabilizing, but the poisson boronoi and poisson delaunay tessellations, they are stabilizing. And here maybe there is an opportunity to under understand what stabilization means. So I consider these stabilization radii, which are simply the, so, so once more, the poisson boronoi tessellation, I use it as an, uh, as an environment. Um, the definition is you, you, you look at a poisson point cloud and attach to every point itself, which, uh, which contains all points that are closer to that point than to, to any other point, and I'm looking at the edges. So I'm looking at, at this stabilization radii, which for, for a given position X, just uh, I, 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 uh, I check the closest point in the underlying Poisson point cloud. And then you can imagine if you, if you check a box and you want, to, you want to check the edge system in that box, then, uh, and you want this to be independent of what happens uh, away from this box. Then if I, if I have another box and I have this annulus between or around this original box and it contains enough points, then these points somehow block away what happens inside this, the original box. So with high probability, so, so in, in a poisson boronoi tessellation, to, in order for, for the tessellation to be dependent over long distances, you need very large void spaces. And if you take away, if you don't have these void spaces, and they're exponentially uh, um, unlikely, by the way, so, so with, with exponentially high probability, what happens in an area, um, in two areas which are far away, uh, is independent. So this is the, um, this is the idea. And, and as you can maybe now understand, the Manhattan grid, which is 
that you use two Poisson point processes on the lines on the x and y axis. I will give you details later. And then you attach infinitely long lines to create this rectangular grid. They are definitely not stabilized because um, these infinitely long lines, they um, transport information over infinitely long distances. So you don't have this spatial independence. And they're much harder to analyze. Other examples create um, other forms of independence. And in, in this example, I like very much because um, you can create a, a, a different uh, strengths of independence. You can, you can really quantify how, how fast these, um, these decorrelation events um, happen. Okay, so here's the first main theorem. I'm in at least two dimensions and I look at a stationary environment and I assume it's, station, it's uh, stabilized. Then if my balls are allowed to be sufficiently large, I do see a supercritical region. This is the statement here. On the other hand, if I'm not in the full coverage regime, so this is a non-trivial regime, under stabilization, I also have a subcritical regime. So really we, we see an, uh, an uh, interesting phenomenon here in phase transition and then when it comes to the the tail behavior of the um, cluster of the origin we we can we we need some qualitative information about the um, about the uh, uh, decorrelation the, the speed of the decorrelation but once we have it uh, with respect to to s um, I also see a subcritical regime for the, um, for the moment of the diameter and the uh, volume. If I'm looking at the number of points, this is always a bit more tricky. I have an additional assumption here, some overshoot condition that, that I need to impose on the environment in order to see uh, um, a non-trivial phase transition with respect to the S moment of, um, of the number of points of the, or of the cluster of the origin. On the other hand, just to, 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 to show you that this is really sharp. So if this um, um, tail is too heavy, under ergodicity, I lose my um, subcritical phase. I'm essentially um, already, I mean, I, you can use some branching process argument. I see that uh, I, have, I, I have infinitely many points connected to the origin and uh, cover an infinite space. So. Maybe later I say a few, few things about the proof. It's a multi-scale argument um, for, for uh, item two and three. The overshoot condition is, is, um, uh, is easily verified by, for, for many examples. Some related work. So um, we started out with a fixed radii in this, in this paper. And only for the volume, not for the uh, diameter, not for the number of points. Um, there is, in principle, an alternative um, uh, way to, to prove the existence of the subcritical regime for the volume and the diameter via a paper by Guare. But the conditions he imposes, I mean, he imposes conditions on general stationary point processes. And I believe it's, it's uh, not easier to, to check these conditions than to follow our proof. The Poisson point process, of course, all, all this, this, this is, is known. And um, some of it is contained in the, in the textbook on the subject. Some of it is contained in another paper by Guare, which was quite influential for our work. There, the multi-scale argument is, is presented for the Poisson case. And just to mention, uh, the uh, non-trivial behavior can also be observed in Gibbs point processes. Just a few things beyond the Poisson case, um, uh, several papers on continuum percolation for Gibbs point processes. Um, some uh, related work on repelling point processes, including Ginebra and Gaussian zeros. Also there the existence is shown, or the uh, uniqueness is shown of the uh, infinite cluster and the non-trivial phase transition. And uh, I will mention one more time um, the, the work for repelling point for um, negatively associated point processes by Yogesh and Vatek. All right, some 
uh, I'll be quick here. Some conditions that can be repla that can be used to to show uh, the condition, the uh, overshoot condition. I'm not going to go into detail. Idea of proof, yeah. Um, the existence of the super of the of the of this um, of the supercritical regime is is a, via a coupling argument towards um, the Cox Boolean model with fixed radii. Here is very briefly the multi-scale argument for items two and three. So we we check uh, the the probability to percolate outside some uh, some ball of uh, of radius alpha. Then one. Um, um, one checks that um, percolating out of an, a 10 alpha ball can be made independent from percolating out of, I mean, so you percolate out of a 10 alpha ball can be written as, um, as percolating out of an alpha ball, but two times independently that creates the square plus some error term. And this error term really governs the asymptotic behavior of, of this quantity. And, the, and you can can somehow look at, at this error term and you, create, you, can, you can read off all the information about the um, percolation probability. As I mentioned, the absence of percolation uh, of a subcritical uh, regime is, is by a branching process argument, which is already present in the, um, in the textbook. All right, so let's move on uh, to get some finer information about um, Cox Boolean models, uh, in particular of its percolation function. And what seems trivial in the Poisson case becomes a bit more tedious in the um, case of random environments, namely uh, the Palm version. So now I want to work with the Palm version. So I want to condition uh, uh, on the event that the origin contains a point. In the case of Poisson, this is easy. You just add this point and you, you, this is even characterization of the Poisson point process. In the case of the um, uh, Cox point process, we have to go back to the original definition of palm. So one way to think of the palm version is you randomly, uh, uniformly um, select a point in the, unit, um, in the unit square, and you look at the point process from the perspective of this point, from the typical point. This is the idea of, uh, of palm. We also need uh, the palm version of the environment, which is just similar. And then we consider the percolation probability. That is the probability that the origin is connected to infinity in the um, Cox Boolean model or in the Gilbert graph, if you wish, under the palm version. So now under this X star, I know that the origin actually is a point. We are now working only with a fixed radius, yeah? So, so basically back into this, into this picture. So we want to understand the asymptotic behavior um, of the percolation probability when let's say we take the radius to infinity. So this guy should, uh, so uh, this is the uh, event that the origin is not, this is the probability of the event that the origin is not connected to infinity and it actually satisfies some large deviation behavior, uh, uh, which goes like this. And maybe, um, so this is a, an older result by Penrose, one of the experts on the field. And maybe one direction here is, is, uh, is quite simple to understand. So uh, if we want to uh, lower bound the probability that the origin is not connected to infinity, we can simply assume that the origin, that the origin is isolated, right? And the origin to be isolated is a void probability under the Poisson point process. So it comes like e to the minus volume Around the, around the origin times lambda. And already there you see the uh, exponential behavior. For the upper bound, it's a bit more, uh, more tricky. And we can now reproduce this, um, this result uh, also in the Cox setting. So um, this lower bound again is, is not so hard, but the rate now um, is, um, is, is, is given in terms of this, um, of this averaging over the environment. So it's, it's not very explicit, but nevertheless, the Poisson point process is gone. So the, the, the rate really only depends on the environment. 
And under some additional conditions like B dependence and the existence of exponential moments, this, this limb int becomes a limb and uh, we get some semi explicit rate function here um, in terms of the environment. This game, we can, so yeah, so we are, iso we are isolating the environment, the, the, the origin. So sometimes it's, um, it's even computable, this, this rate function in terms of, for instance, in the, in the shot noise case. Um, yeah, so we, 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 we know that, that the percolation probability goes exponentially fast to one um, uh, if the radius is increasing. So in the classical Poisson case, it's, you can immediately interchange lambda and R. So it's, there's a scaling relation between the, the, the size of the balls and the intensity of the point process. This is not true anymore in, with a random environment. So we have to present a separate theorem. And also the strategy, how, um, how this, um, the, um, the, the event, what is the cheapest way to make the origin be disconnected from infinity for large lambda, lambdas is now, again, depending on the environment. And it's not necessary anymore to isolate the, the, um, the origin. It could be that it's, it's cheaper to look at the um, environment somehow further away from the origin and then just create an R annulus that would separate the origin from, the, from, the, from infinity. So it's isolated. So, it, we, so that's why this uh, rate function, again, is, a, is, um, is um, a bit indirect in terms of the environment and just says that we have to look for the cheapest way to isolate the origin that might not be to isolate it directly, but maybe there's some annulus later on, which is easier to, to, um, to remove all the Poisson points and then, uh, then make the origin disconnect from, from, the, from infinity. Again, under some additional conditions, um, this is a, um, an LDB. Yeah. So the cheapest way, for instance, for the Poisson, uh, so we know that the origin is, is, a, is a point. It must uh, lie in the, in the environment. So this is maybe a Poisson, this is, this is one part of a poisson Voronoi tessellation environment. And then the easiest way to isolate it is uh, really to, to remove all the points directly around it. So in some cases, one can compute the, uh, the rate function explicitly, depending on the environment. Yeah, some, some more information, maybe I can be a bit quicker here. So, okay, you can also use a universal uh, Poisson approximation. So the Poisson point process probably rescaled uh, by, by letting the radius grow and at the same time, the intensity go to zero. So so that you have this constant, the Poisson approximation. So the Cox point process and any other point process converges to the um, Poisson point process weekly, and that transfers also to the percolation probability, which is of course non-local. So the, you have to you have to do some work. So this part is actually easy. This part is much harder, and you use um, stabilization. So under this rescaling, you approach the um, percolation probability of the classical model. Uh, yeah, here is another result, uh, a more recent result um, on um, what, what is sometimes called sharp, face, sharp thresholds. So uh, we are looking here also at a Cox point process and the, the, um, the environment is, um, is now uh, much more restricted. It, it needs to be B dependent and also the uh, intensity must be bounded. So we, we are, for instance, you can consider the um, Poisson Voronoi no, tessellation environment, but you somehow, by superimposing a grid, you make it locally dependent only. And then maybe you also have to, to, um, to um, bound the intensity, which is, which is unbounded for the original Poisson Voronoi tessellation, but you have to just set a, set a fixed bound. So if you have a B dependent system, and uh, which is, um, has a, has a uh, finite upper bound on the intensity, then we are in a in a very nice regime where in fact the, um, the um, in the subcritical regime, the probability to reach uh, the outside of an, of an N box goes to, to zero exponentially fast. And you have even 
uh, and very nice scaling here at the critical point. This is, um, this is based on the OSSS inequality approach, which is um, um, presented in the framework of continuum systems um, in this paper by Dominico Park. I have a few more minutes. I'm not gonna not gonna, not gonna make it to 45 pages. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll skip everybody. No, you have to sit here. Um, we we also wanted to move beyond stabilizing environments, and the the easiest case for us seemed to be the Manhattan Grid. So here is a definition. I explained it in words already earlier. So yeah, this is technical. You should uh, look at this. You have a Poisson point process. On the x-axis, you have a Poisson point process on the y-axis, whenever you see independent, of course, on every point you draw a line and you, you get a rectangular grid. And then you put the Poisson points on top independently. This is a non-stabilizing situation. Uh, if you look at the point, uh, uh, um, if, you, if you remove the, if you, if you remove for a second these, these lines and, and you just look at the points, then they are correlated over infinite distances because of these lines. You can have many lines close by creating such a highway situation. You have this highway situation also all the way, and this, this, um, this influences each other. So here the situation is much harder and it's, it's away from what I presented to you before. You can, for instance, see this, that there is no sharp threshold phenomenon anymore, right? So this, um, this is essentially saying that the percolation probability to go out of an n box now does not go to zero exponentially fast for no parameters. It actually goes uh, goes uh, polynomially. So we, we are in a completely different situation. Uh, nevertheless, with the help of um, of this paper of Hoffman uh, about dependent percolation, it's a discrete model. Um, um, but we can make good use of it. We can recover uh, non-trivial phase transitions. So here is the uh, existence of a uh, of a percolation regime, percolation regime for sufficiently many streets or for sufficiently large intensity of the Poisson points. You can even you can even leave one uh, the rect let's say the, the vertical streets uh, untouched and then and just increase the um, the uh, horizontal streets, and, and you can still uh, arrive at a percolation regime. Here is just briefly our input from from Hoffmann. He he looks at <coughs> at these um, um, environments, which are given by um, so so the probability to um, to connect a, a vertex to its right neighbor, conditioned on the environment. Is, is, is this geometric? So you, you draw these, so the environment N is, are these, let's say these numbers up here, here and here and here and here. And it just tells you, well, if this is a large number, it becomes harder to, to traverse. It becomes P like this, P of the, to this number to traverse, let's say from here to here. So under some light tail conditions on the environment, indeed one can show that this um, randomly stretched lattice model has a supercritical regime, and we can use this to, to lift it to our continuum system and also show existence of a supercritical regime. For the subcritical regime, it's, a, it's harder. We have to create a piles argument. We have to create some blocking argument using the dual lattice, it's a classical approach, but here it's, 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 it's a bit tech, more technical. And to, to show that there is no percolation, you, you can also work with the dual graph um, show that it's supercritical and even more so has some blocking interfaces. In, in one picture, the main idea is that you can accumulate, you can somehow uh, merge um, streets to, to bands and labels, and then um, the limiting model is, is um, yeah, or well, the limiting model, one can, one can show these things. All right. Um, you know what? Uh, I'm going to skip this. This was uh, an application for um, um, 
for our industry partners where we look at um, at um, a, a mobile system of, of uh, devices moving in a street system and we can derive also um, non-trivial phase transitions and I thank you for your attention. Any questions? Sorry. Uh, just, um, uh, so if, just to check if I didn't miss, so uh, model doesn't have insertion tolerance, right? Or Say it again? The mo I don't know. It's working. The model doesn't have, ins uh, so when you prove the uniqueness. Yes, it doesn't uh, have include. Uh, uh, so, but you still use a Burton Kin type argument. Or yes. Or? Okay. I can use FKG condition on the environment and I and can still make, because, yeah. So what helps is like, so instead of bifurcations or all these things, so you use some coarse notion of bifurcations solved by this R connectivity or is it something like that? Yeah, the, yeah I mean, the, the Burton Keen argument is of course, yeah, you cannot have too many bifurcations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but the main tool is really that you you have enough support from your environment such that, um, such that the original argument works for the Poisson points in that environment. You have to just make sure that the environment has enough support that it doesn't uh, um, force you to be separated. Okay.